Call it what you will. A bully, a bus, a splitty, a bay, a barn door, a combi, a panel van, a samba, or just the plain old Type 2. And whether it's used as a 12-seater, a bakery van, an ambulance, a flatbed, a surfmobile, or a hippie hangout, above all else, it's a Volkswagen Transporter. The revolutionary van that lives on today in the VW T5, more than 60 years after its initial conception. Developed as a multi-purpose vehicle for the post-war generation, for most people in the UK, the Volkswagen Type 2 is probably best known and loved in its guise as a camper van. A van that exists in as many styles as there are owners. For surely, this is the Volkswagen secret. The transporter's remarkable design enables it to be whatever its owners desire. Millions have rolled off production lines around the world and yet each is cherished as an individual. Each has its own character. The early transporters are noisy, slow and struggle up hills. They need regular attention, often have high maintenance costs and inevitably break down. But that's just part of their extraordinary appeal. Surfers, adventurers, families and collectors, an eclectic mix of ages and backgrounds united in a common passion for their VW campervan. For all of them, the journey is always as important as the destination. This is the story of how a flatbed vehicle used in a bombed out German factory run by a British army officer at the end of World War II ultimately led to the creation of the world's most iconic and best loved van. A van that has spawned numerous imitators but one that's never been bettered. A van born of the needs of a post-war economy that became a world beater, only limited by the imagination of its owners. Built by Volkswagen in its German plants, first at Wolfsburg and later in Hanover, remarkably, there have been only five key design changes in over 60 years. Testament to the extraordinary strength and vision of the original blueprint, drawn by a flamboyant and self-serving Dutchman. Of course, no story of the VW campervan would be complete without acknowledging the role of the conversion companies, both official and unofficial, involved in creating the world's most famous home on wheels. But many are surprised to learn that it wasn't until the arrival of the T5 in the 21st century that VW made its own camper conversions. For over 50 years, it was left to the likes of Westfalia, Dormobile and Devon, amongst others, to adapt the VW Transporter to a myriad of camper van layouts. Today, Volkswagen's box on wheels has achieved cult status, with a following that is fanatical, joyous, unconventional, practical, experimental, and simply unquantifiable. Some want genuine stock perfection. Others prefer the rat look, a handcrafted interior, or customized paintwork. Some are used daily, others venture around the globe, while some are for family getaways, others hang out at the ever-expanding number of VW shows. However they look, sound, run or leak, however young or old, whatever their design, they are VW camper vans, from T1 to T5, and this is their story.
this your day. This your day. The fans want you to have a brand new shiny Volkswagen station wagon. Station wagon. The seeds of the campervan's creation lie with Ferdinand Porsche. Dr. Porsche had designed an inexpensive two-door streamlined sedan with an air-cooled rear engine. But just as development was underway, Porsche's backers pulled out. The Porsche Commenda joint design had a very specific set of criteria for the people's car, or Volkswagen. It had to carry two adults and three children, or three soldiers and a machine gun. It had to be able to drive at 60 miles per hour. The engine had to be air-cooled so that it didn't freeze in Germany's winter. And fuel consumption would have to return at least 33 miles per gallon. The idea was to produce it in large quantities and people would pay for it um, by a weekly subscription. German families were encouraged to buy five Reichmark stamps towards the purchase of the new Volkswagens. And soon, 337,000 had joined the scheme. The car was renamed the KDF Wagen and it was to be manufactured in a mile-long purpose-built factory with 90,000 workers housed nearby in a brand new town called Start des KDF Wagens. The war intervened and uh, so the cars other than prototypes were not produced until after the war and the factory that had been specially designed to produce the car uh, was turned over to war production and as a result got bombed. The factory was pressed into manufacturing the Kubelwagen, a military vehicle based on the KDF Wagen. The plant also produced an amphibious variant called the Schwimmwagen. Remarkably, because the town and factory were so new, neither featured on Allied bombing maps so vehicle production continued unhindered through the war. But it was only when the factory started to include aircraft repairs and ordnance production that the factory finally came to the attention of the Allies. The US bombed the KDF factory in a series of daylight raids. US tanks arrived on the 10th of April, 1945, and by the 25th of May, the town was renamed Wolfsburg. By June, the town was situated in the British sector under British control. The clamour to exact reparations from the Germans meant that many thought anything salvageable from the factory would be sent to Britain or snatched by the Russians. The future of Volkswagen was on a knife edge. It would take the vision of a British army officer to save the factory in the face of impossible odds. But for one man, Major Ivan Hurst, there wouldn't have been a campervan. Major Ivan Hurst was a 29-year-old engineer who was serving with the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. He was told to take charge of the Volkswagen plant, that, that his words were just to sit on, on the plant and to occupy it. At the time, there was no plan to put the factory back into production. The Allied military government had come to the conclusion that they would only have a German motor industry based on those companies that existed before the war. And Volkswagen hadn't got that far before the war. They weren't a, a producing company. So they were on the list of industries to be sold off uh, as part of the reparations that Germany was supposed to pay to the Allies for having caused the war. A number of British and American motor manufacturers were offered the chance to purchase the factory. Having carried out extensive reports, all were of the opinion that there was no future for Volkswagen. Sir William Roots of Roots Motors and leader of the British auto industry told Major Hurst, if you think we'll ever get cars built here, you're a bloody fool, young man. A formal evaluation by the British military also found little potential. But Ivan Hurst had other ideas. He was never given orders actually to put the Volkswagen factory back into production, but he saw that as 
um, a side benefit, if you like, for benefiting the local community and, and creating local employment and creating a local economy. He was visited by Colonel Michael McAvoy, who was uh, another Remy officer serving in one of the headquarters in Germany. A racing engineer, Colonel McAvoy, by coincidence, had test driven a KDF Wagen at the 1939 Berlin Motor Show. Hurst and McAvoy thought they could produce Kubelwagens for use by the occupying forces. But of course all the equipment had been spread to various parts of Germany so that the Allied forces couldn't restart production. There were various bits of cars lying around and, and they assembled one and, and, and got it running. So he painted one of the vehicles in army green, drove it around to the British Army on the Rhine headquarters and they ordered 20,000. The thing for which Volkswagen recognises him was that he was the person who secured the first commercial order and that put Volkswagen on a commercial footing. The future of Volkswagen was assured and the birth of the VW Transporter took a giant step closer. The British Army, through Ivanhurst's connections, lent the factory forklift trucks to move bits and pieces around the factory. And I remember Ivan saying that the German head of production came to him and said, look, we're going to have to stop production shortly because uh, the British Army are demanding the vehicles that we're using to supply the lines, um, demanding their return. The German plant manager, Rudolf Braumann, was convinced the forklift's loss was the beginning of the end of Beetle manufacture. Production would grind to a halt without them. Hearst was altogether more phlegmatic. So he said, well, we're a car company, aren't we? Can't we make something? And Ivanhurst sketched out a very rough idea, and the factory's experimental department translated that into the format of a small platform truck. So in a couple of days, um, they presented him with a Beetle chassis with a seat above the engine facing forwards and, and a big flat load space. And, and this indeed became uh, uh, a support vehicle for the factory and I joined Volkswagen in 1988 and they were still being used at the Wolfsburg plant then. It's likely that the story would have ended there if it wasn't for the Plattenwagen and the arrival in Wolfsburg of a flamboyant Dutchman who many believe is the true godfather of the transporter. Ben Pon had followed the fortunes of the Beatles since pre-war times. He'd always believed in the car and was determined to become Holland's main importer. It was on seeing this on one of his visits to the factory that the Dutchman, Ben Pon, um, thought, ah, maybe they could make a commercial vehicle. But a year later, on the 23rd of April 1947, at another meeting, Ben Pon first sketched something that had been inspired by the Plattenwagen. So he drew in his notebook, you can still see the notebook, he just drew it shaped like a loaf, like that. Engine at the back, over the wheels, driver at the front, over the wheels. And this is it, still, same machine. Fantastic. Well, this is regarded as the start of, of the Volkswagen commercial vehicle as we know it. It's drawing a simple, slightly more box type shape to produce a very efficient, um, space efficient load carrier based on the Beetle. With its engine positioned over the back axle and the driver over the front axle, sitting beneath a sloping cab roof, this was a van with an unmistakable loaf shape that was to become familiar to millions. Hearst apparently liked the idea of this loaf-like van, seeing its potential in the commercial market. But with the order books stacking up for the Beetle, Hearst's superior, Colonel Radcliffe, blocked further progress. He felt that VW didn't have the time or resources to consider building a new vehicle. And so, to Hearst's dismay, Pond's idea was shelved. By the late 1940s, Hearst's focus moved to trying to sell Volkswagen. No buyers could be found, and so Hearst was instead tasked with finding a German to manage the company and build up a local management team. But eventually, somebody found a guy who had worked before the war for Opel, another German firm, 
and because that was part of General Motors, he had been to America, he was familiar with uh, the English language, and so in 1948, in January, Heinz Nordhoff took over the running of the factory. Soon after his appointment, Nordhoff, with his truck and van experience, quickly realised that VW urgently needed a commercial vehicle to complement the Beetle. Heinz Nordhoff had the vision to say, yes, we're going to build a people's transporter. VW's newly appointed chief designer, Alfred Hasner, was briefed about the new vehicle design during an autumnal car journey. And within weeks, on the 20th of November 1948, he presented two design outlines for Nordhoff's vehicle. This vehicle, Hasner said, was designed for town and country, short and long distances, motorways and field tracks, goods and passengers, retail and industry. This commercial van is suitable for all sectors of business, express delivery and freight transport. For example, a minibus, special purpose vehicle, post van, ambulance or mobile shops. Hasner's design, known as version A, imagined a van with a flat front and a dramatic roof overhang. Version B had a slightly curved and raked cab. Both had split windscreens, sliding cab windows, and the plunging V offset by the oversized VW badge. Nordhoff chose design B, which looked remarkably similar to Pond's 1947 sketch. Whether this was just coincidence, as Nordhoff always claimed, or as a direct result of Pond's involvement, is impossible to say. Nordhoff maintained that the two designs were a result of intensive market research and nothing more. Work began in earnest on a prototype for the VW29, as the new project was known internally. A scale model was produced for wind tunnel tests at the University of Braunschweig. The initial results of a drag coefficient of 0.75 were poor, but when they replaced the flat-nosed versions of the new vehicle with a dramatically more rounded and streamlined profile, incorporating a V to the windscreen and roofline, the drag coefficient dropped to 0.44, less even than the Beetle. To his designer's chagrin, Nordhoff became involved in every tiny detail of the VW29. He even concerned himself with the Spartan interior design of the driver's cab, demanding that the two-seater be modified to seat three people abreast. But Nordhoff's continuing interference, difficult working conditions, undue haste, plus a shortage of design manpower, drove Hasner and his team into making an elementary mistake. From the outset, the new vehicle was to be based on the Beetle chassis, simply widened to carry the box-like structure of the new van. Because of the Beetle's well-known robustness, it was assumed the chassis would be sturdy enough to carry the much larger loads expected of it. But less than a month into the trials, disaster struck. When the prototype returned to Wolfsburg, the van was six inches lower. The weight of the body and its load had broken the back of the flat section at the center of the platform frame. But Nordhoff was undeterred. He insisted that the transporter still be ready to start production by the 1st of November. Hasner dispensed with the Beetle chassis in its entirety. In a breathtakingly short space of time, his team developed an entirely new chassis welded together with the van body as a single unit on a specially strengthened subframe. It was much heavier than the Beetle chassis, but also much stronger. By welding the steel floor to the frame, the team added further rigidity. It resulted in a vehicle with the same wheelbase as the Beetle that was only eight inches longer. Nordhoff didn't want to go to the expense of a new engine, so the Beetle's 1131cc engine was kept with the wartime Kubelwagen's reduction gear hubs. It was at this point that Nordhoff's brilliance really shined. He'd begun to realize that VW29 could be more than just a utilitarian van.
a great deal more. Once testing was complete, Nordhoff demanded a range of prototypes be built to include a pickup and an eight-seater minibus, as well as an ambulance. The issue of what to call the new vehicle was raised, but when on the 12th of November 1949, Heinz Nordhoff revealed the world's first truly multi-purpose van to the assembled press, he just called the panel van the Volkswagen Type 2. Legend has it that the word transporter appeared in some early VW promotional material, and eventually the name stuck, although some at Wolfsburg continued to call the panel van the Type 2. And on the 8th of March 1950, the very first panel van, Dove Blue, rolled off the production line. Production had begun at a steady rate of 10 vehicles a day. The first transporters were available in a variety of colours, including pearl, dove blue, brown beige and chestnut brown. Vehicles could also be specified in two-tone. The motoring press quickly fell in love with the new van. And there's little doubt that the transporter represented a radical alternative to anything else in the austere post-war market. Various firms and whatever they were, whether they were jewellers or whether they were chocolate firms or whether they were builders, they could paint their names on it. It became one of the handiest vans ever and there was nothing else like it. There was no Ford Thames at the time. There was nothing like that. One of the earliest customers, and certainly one of the first to customise their VW van, was the 4711 Eau de Cologne Company. Realising its potential as an advertising space, as well as a transporter, the company quickly repainted their panel van. The first owner's manual stated, The VW Transporter is a vehicle with unbeaten road holding, high cornering and extraordinary acceleration. But the manual recommended a maximum long distance speed of 47 miles per hour, adding a further warning. Do not forget that it would be completely irresponsible to charge your transporter along the motorway at top speed for hours on end. No vehicle of this size can withstand such treatment undamaged. The distinctive split front pane was for money saving reasons rather than anything aesthetic. In the early 1950s, the window technology required to create a single pane of curved glass was simply too expensive. And aesthetics had nothing to do with the pleasingly rounded shape of the roof pane coming to a point above the split windows. This was the largest single panel on the van and in testing it was discovered that a rounded top gave much better performance both in terms of noise and fuel economy. With its bug-eyed lights, plunging V of its double-skinned nose and oversized VW roundel, the van had a naturally happy appearance. The indicators were a semaphore style, their arms located beneath the driver and passenger doors. The front bumper was a blade shape and was always painted in a colour known as silver white. What was noticeable by its absence in the early models was any form of ventilation. The driver and passenger windows slid open, but initially the quarter lights could not be pivoted. Also absent at the rear of the panel van was any form of bumper, which would remain the case until late 1953. The very early ones, they were called barn doors because they're huge engine lid and they had slow motors and they, you know, they didn't have full width dashboards and stuff like that. The huge single-skinned top-opening engine lid stretched from the bottom to the swage around the vehicle. Continuing the spartan look of the rear were the two small rear lights, a large illuminated pressing for the number plate and above this a small single brake light. The barn door engine lid meant that unusually for a van, there was no rear access. Instead, access was from outward opening double doors situated immediately behind the driver's door. By 1951, the option of doors fitted to both sides was available. 
The swage ran around the side of the van, helping to break up the extensive metal panels, which were themselves interrupted by louver air vents that cooled both the engine and the cargo compartment. Air ventilation would be an ongoing issue in the transporters for some years to come. The transporter featured 16-inch steel wheels, and like the front bumper, the panel van's wheels were painted silver white. Although other models in the range soon began to feature body-coloured accessories. The beetle-like domed hubcaps were initially painted in light grey, with the VW emblem picked out in white. The transporter featured an oil cooler that forced air from the exterior louvers across the engine to cool it. That air was also used to warm the cabin, but in practice, this only worked well and safely when the engine was clean and oil-free, otherwise the smell within the cab could be overpowering. Brakes were hydraulic. Steering was again beetle-based, using a worm and peg system, which delivered touch and feel far superior to its competitors, thanks in part to the large diameter of the three-spoke steering wheel. Again, the all-independent torsion bar system of suspension was borrowed from the Beetle, which in turn had inherited it from the Kubelwagen. Porsche's Kubelwagen was also responsible for the gears on the transporter, using the faithful crash box four-speed system, as both vehicles needed help when accelerating, particularly under heavy loads. The transporter ran on a six-volt battery, a system that was in keeping with European design at the time, but it meant that the battery could barely illuminate the headlights. The transporter's seating was basic. Nordhoff's request for a separate seat for the driver had been ignored, probably on cost grounds. Instead, there was a simple vinyl-covered bench seat for three. The metal floor was covered by a single piece of rubber matting. The door panels were completed in plain fiberboard, the load space, roof panel and all the other interior areas were just painted metal. Instrumentation comprised of a speedometer calibrated to a maximum of 50 miles per hour, warning indicators for dynamo, main beam and oil pressure, and the left and right semaphores. A fuel gauge was considered unnecessary because of the existence of a reserve fuel tank. There were some luxuries. Despite the 6-volt battery, the interior cab and cargo area did feature electric lighting. And there was a rudimentary ventilation and heating system, circulated via roof ducts. Back in 2007, Volkswagen suddenly rediscovered their past. And part of that was they decided to invest in a collection of old vehicles which they would restore and use for promotion and exhibition. So Volkswagen UK, as part of that, um, they've just unveiled a 1954 barn door panel van. It's also a right-hand drive vehicle which ties in nicely for the UK market because 1954 was the first time that right-hand drive vehicles became available. This one's quite interesting because it was imported by a London dealership who then the following week re-exported it to Australia. So it spent its time in Australia, um, which is probably why it was ordered with the factory safari windscreens for the climate. And it was then brought back by an enthusiast for restoration a few years back um, and then spotted by somebody who was looking for one for VW and they took it along to the restorer who then spent two years and a lot of heartache building it back to as near original as he possibly could. There were a few subtle differences which most people wouldn't recognise um, to do with things like positions of the spare wheel, um, to do with the shape of the vents um, and just general refinements in the body but basically it was pretty much the same. In the Feldarbeit. Vor allem bei Arbeitsspitzen macht sich der VW Transporter besonders bezahlt. Entfernungen zwischen In May 1950, the campervan took another step closer to reality with the production of the nine-seater VW Kleinbus or microbus, designed to carry passengers over long distances in some comfort. 
It featured glass where once there were only metal panels, soft cloth headlining, and vinyl-clad fiberboard panels. Concurrent with the microbus, and to great acclaim, Nordhoff's team introduced the Kombinations Kraftwagen, Kombi for short, with its removable rear bench seating and three windows on either side. Interior panels, insulation and a rear window came as optional extras. Nordhoff's dream of creating a dual-role vehicle of freight mover and people carrier had become a reality. It was a true forerunner of the popular MPVs of today. Later, in 1951, VW launched the Krankenwagen. This was a transporter converted into an ambulance. The ambulance was the first of the Sonderausfuhrungen, or special models, that proved just how incredibly versatile the transporter was. And the pickup, or Pritchenwagen, which followed, showed just how ingenious VW could be. More models equaled more sales, and transporter sales were rising fast. On the 9th of October 1951, Nordhoff assembled the world's motoring press to announce delivery of the 100,000th transporter. But more importantly, customers realized that, thanks to the Combi's flexibility, they could experiment with multiple configurations for the van's interior. But then, of course, one of the things that it was used for was camping because people just thought, well, get all the rubbish out of a weekend, throw the kids in and go away to the mountains. The timing was perfect too. Increased leisure time and the concept of holidays for the masses had arrived. Family camping fitted neatly into the economic reality of the post-war economy. A Dresden garage claims to have created the first VW campervan in 1951 when it employed a local coach builder to fit out a combi to a customer's special order. But it was another company, Westfalia, a caravan and trailer manufacturer employed by US Army officers to convert their combis, which was to become synonymous with the VW campervan. In fact, by 1952, Westfalia had already converted nearly 50 transporters to individual order, many of them ending up in the USA. Some of the American guys that were in the Army of Occupation fell in love with them, took them back to the States, and it grew and grew and grew and grew. Westfalia eventually became the most famous of all VW campervan converters and developed a modular production system called the Camping Box. Well, the camping box is a good idea um, because basically the vehicle can be used in the week for work and then the camping box be lifted into the vehicle for weekends, then to be slept in and used for leisure use, sort of camping and sort of family, family weekends away, and then back for Monday morning, take it out, use it for work again. The age of the VW camper van had arrived. The brochure said, your country house on wheels will accompany you wherever you want to go, into the mountains, to the seaside. It's a 1952 split screen barn door panel van with a camping, bo camping box interior. BBT, uh, Bob in Belgium, um, purchased the 52 barn door and the camping box relatively at the same time. So he thought it'd be nice to put the two together and sort of keep some history on both parts, really. It's, it's quite stock, quite original. It's been restored, but it's been restored um, to as near factory as possible. The interior itself is not original to the bus, but is one of three uh, camping box interiors built by Westphalia in 1970. Westphalia decided that they were going to keep three barn doors back for their museum, 
They tried to locate the camping boxes to put in the museum buses. They couldn't find any anywhere, so they, they got the, the factory to build three. The engine is uh, 25 horsepower, uh, which is original to the bus, matching numbers. Been rebuilt, but it's the original engine. It's very slow. We managed on the sat-nav 40 miles per hour on the journey, which was uh, probably close to topping out, you know. <laughs> Can be hard to drive at some times, but still fun, still fun. Within two years of the arrival of the nine-seater microbus, VW had introduced a deluxe version known as the Samba, complete with optional sliding canvas roof, plexiglass roof skylights, chrome fittings, and high-level trim. Although important as a milestone in the story of the transporter, the Samba was not a huge financial success for VW. Compared to other models in the range, selling roughly a quarter of the number of microbuses. Ask any VW enthusiast which first generation model they would like to own, and generally, they would answer the Samba. The Holy Grail, which is a right-hand drive 23 window Samba, which most bus owners would dream and wish to own. So uh, the actual prices that they fetch now are just going up and up and up. It's like buying a new house or, you know, it's a massive, massive investment and you, you can't lose money on something like this. The early Samba's rarity only adds to their desirability. Pre-1955 buses are completely different to anything else. Um, simply because Volkswagen undertook massive changes um, in March of that year and changed a lot of features about the bus. Um, the most important and noticeable one is the, fact, the size of the rear engine lid. The engine lid goes from the bottom of the valance up to the bottom of the window, whereas later buses, they have the shorter engine lid with a rear hatch. The dash is compl completely different, very minimal, um, very basic. A lot of the running gear is different, and they're just unique. The interior came from a Swedish bus, um, and uh, I swapped it for my middle seat which is kind of sacrilege, but it's my bus and that's what I wanted to do, and I, I have no regrets whatsoever. In March 1955, major styling and mechanical changes were implemented. And in 1955, the transport had a, a redesign and it got the shape of the Spitty, the T1, that everyone knows now. Um, so that was the full width dashboard and all those kinds of things that one recognises and different indicators and things like that. But now came something far more visually significant, the new cab roof design, which created the now familiar overhang above the split window. It enabled the concealment of twin grills, instrumental in greatly improving heating and ventilation. Air was now delivered to a distribution box beneath the cab roof panel, which could be mechanically controlled. Another significant and much welcome change was to the rear styling, allowing the introduction of a tailgate. The smaller engine space saw the fuel filler repositioned to the right-hand side of the vehicle and the spare wheel placed behind the driver's seat. The transporter now boasted a capacity of 4.8 cubic meters. The chassis was further strengthened. Hydraulic shock absorbers fitted to improve the ride and 15-inch wheels replaced the original 16-inch type. Interior styling was also improved. The austere functional dashboard was given a makeover, resulting in a more attractive, full-width design, similar to the Samba. Nineteen fifty-five was also the year that building began on a vast new factory near Hanover. The transporter's continuing success convinced Heinz Nordhoff that the time was right. Opening in 1956, the factory was described as the most modern and beautiful automobile factory in Europe and was soon producing 400 transporters a day, rising to 750 by the early 1960s. In 
In the UK during the mid-1950s, all commercial vehicles, such as the VW Transporter, were subject to purchase tax and restricted to a maximum speed of just 30 miles per hour. However, motorhomes were exempt on both counts, providing the internal fittings such as the beds, cooker, wardrobe, dining area and water carrying equipment were permanent. Early converter and camper van legend Peter Pitt tried to get around the VW commercial vehicle issue by deliberately driving his VW camper conversion through the Royal Park in Windsor, which had a ban on commercial vehicles. He was subsequently arrested, and the resulting court case ruled that Pitt's motorhome was not a commercial vehicle. Unfortunately for Peter Pitt and other converters, Continuing high import duty precluded the Volkswagen from the standard motorhome range until 1960. The Combi was an almost instant hit in Australia when it arrived in the early 50s. The Australian love affair with the VW Combi had begun. It's a 1959 van from Australia and uh, when it came over it, there was nothing in the back at all, it was just bare metal, typical Australian combi and uh, we built um, a reproduction, Devon interior to go inside it of uh, the similar age, so it's, an, uh, it's a late 50s Devon interior in a late 50s bus and the roof tent is a recent acquisition. The only firm at that time authorised by Volkswagen to produce and sell VW campers in the UK was J.P. White of Sidmouth, under the trade name Devon Conversions. These were equipped with two bench seats, a wardrobe, two cupboards situated in the rear, and a cooker. This is one of the earlier, uh, one of the earlier models of it. Um, and it just it slowly evolves and gets better and better. I mean, I, I love my interior, but there's lots of things in it that, don't, that aren't very practical. There was, no, there was no question that I just wanted a split-screen van. Um, I wanted an old camper. Um, I wasn't prepared for how much they'd gone up since. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot more expensive than I thought, but um, I, I think it's worth every penny for the amount of enjoyment I've got out of it. Devon conversions went from strength to strength. From only 56 conversions in 1957, by 1960, over a thousand units were produced annually. Um, I have a 1960 23 window right hand drive with an original Devon interior. This bus is like a 23 window Samba, which is special. What makes it even more special, it's a right hand drive and it's got a private plate and it's got the original De Devon interior. And they made 23 window Sambas from 1952 up to 1963. In the early 60s, they were used as microbuses to uh, export and people round to uh, hotels and back to the beach and back. When it was built in 1960, um, it went from Germany the factory in Hanover uh, to Sweden because what happened in the late 50s, early 60s, um, Sweden changed the government and they went from left hand drive to right hand drive. From a 1960, you had uh, the small hella lights on the back, uh, you had the bullet indicators on the front, and also you had, with a deluxe microbus model, you had all the chrome trim all the way around as well. It was found in a gravel pit in Sweden. When in, uh, it got imported, um, I think it was in 1995. I think it was 45 to 50 panels that have been actually replaced on it, so it's been totally rebuilt bus. Uh, they call the original panels NLS, which is new old stock, so uh, they're quite hard, so this is, what, this is what makes this bus very special. It was actually a micro bus when it was like uh, refurbished, like I think it was seven years ago now. Um, you've got two bulkheads, um, so you can sit two people on the back seat and another two people facing each other. You've got the table which screws into the, um, the floor which, uh, and then you've got uh, an original Dudley cooker and also you've got a water pump as well 
and the actual two bench seats um, go out into a bed. So uh, it's got all the kit for a, a good uh, family sort of camping weekend away. A Volkswagen is a nice station wagon to have around the house. It'll seat your whole family comfortably, average 23 miles to a gallon of regular, and hold a month's supply of groceries. Its air-cooled engine is rear-mounted to get you through snow and mud. VW continued to innovate with new sized engines and further variants as the austerity of the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s. VW's overseas customers with a sense of adventure were invited to pick up their van direct from Germany before driving home. This tourist delivery program was run in conjunction with Westfalia who would complete the conversion ready for the new customer to drive away. Many vans were collected and shipped to the USA, often after the new owners had traveled through Europe. Others on the delivery program found their way to South Africa. Not really knowing that much about Westphalia's at the time, um, I didn't realize what a, a rare van it was until I'd actually bought it and uh, really got into it really. A 1960 Westphalia SO23. Well, the SO23 is basically just what, what interior you get. The, the, the specific layout, like with these wardrobes and the bed system. Westphalia offered the SO23 interior options for three years, between 1959 and 1961. The SO23, which is this one, is probably one of the more sought after ones in right hand drive form. Um, which uh, there's not many of them, there's only about three or four in the UK at the moment. It's the original colours, uh, which is mango green on the bottom and seagull grey on the top. Um, everything about it is as it should be when it was brand new really. Everything you see, uh, even the awning, the awning's the original awning to the van. Um, it looks more like a Punch and Judy sort of thing, but these are the original things really. And again, they're very, very rare to get hold of, especially in right hand drive form. This particular van, it came with every extra you could order from Volkswagen. Um, it's got opening safaris at the front. Um, every window is a pop out, so they all open up. Well, the interior has totally stripped back because uh, it was from South Africa. All the uh, wood was peeling and uh, so we refurbished everything in it, really. All the running gear is new, new gearbox, new engine, uh, all the brakes, shock absorbers, uh, all new glass in it. I put new glass in it because it was uh, delaminating from the sun in South Africa. Uh, all the soft furnishings are, are new, but they're to the original spec. There's a, a, a guy remaking the stuff. Uh, you know, to, to the original sort of standard and uh, so that, you know, it, it costs more but I, I went for that really because uh, it is original. By the 1960s, the Devon had changed considerably and improved. The campers were equipped with a double bed and single beds for children. A large awning, curtains all round and even stainless steel cutlery for four. This is a, a 1962 Devon Caravette. It's one of the last years with a small rear uh, window in the hatch. Um, the, the year after this, a 63, that's when there were a lot of changes. Um, but uh, the uh, important thing about this particular vehicle is its originality and low mileage, authenticity. I had a phone call from a friend who said there's a really nice van for sale, we should go and have a look and bring some money with you as well. I was told that it's very original and this and that, but until you actually see the, a particular vehicle, you don't know. Um, we, we had a good look at it, and sure enough, it was pretty much original, so uh, we bought it and drove it back to London. And closer inspection is like, you can't really find many faults. You know, a few little dings in the bodywork, but um, other than that, very, very original and low mileage. The elderly gentleman bought it brand new in 62. Um, I have the original sales invoice and uh, he paid just over 900 pounds for the van, brand new. Um, it has now done 31,000 miles. 
which for a right-hand drive vehicle being rust-free, low mileage, it makes it quite unique. The only work I've done is to paint the wheels and the bumpers and fit a new set of tyres. Leuchtende Buchstaben symbolisierten in Europas größtem Automobilwerk eine stolze Bilanz. Nordhoff welcomed the press back to VW on the 2nd of October 1962, 12 and a half years after its debut, to announce the one millionth transporter. In Britain, Martin Walter Limited had been producing motorhome conversions based on the Bedford CA chassis since 1954. The by then famous Dormobile conversion had evolved gradually. But its most striking design feature was the Dormobile's revolutionary elevating hinged roof, enabling adults to stand and two people to sleep in fold-away roof-level bunks. Yeah, this is a, a 1963 Splitty. It's a SO36 Westphalia camper. This is very special because the 36 model has the Dormobile roof. Uh, in 63, Westphalia didn't make a, 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 a roof, their own roof, so they have to import a Dormobile roof because uh, a lot of people want more beds in the, in the van. And when, uh, when they got a Dormobile roof, there was two beds more up, upstairs. I mean, there's only three to five left in the whole world of this model, so it's very, very rare. And it's hard to find a, a model that's so, uh, so original as this. Uh, it has all the small bits that everyone wants uh, for, or are looking for in their Westphalia. The SO36 has a very special interior that's uh, with a flip sheet. It's a flip sheet camper and uh, it's only made in, uh, in three conversions, SO34 and 35 and 36. They have a, a chandelier, a little, a little lamp. They have a, a chair, a folding chair. It has uh, the water canister, water ball, from 63, everything from 63 that went with the van. Normally that's thrown away for a long time ago, but this have everything. I have the big awning for it. I have the, a little uh, foyer awning for the, for the van. The only thing I was looking for was the toilet. There's a toilet tent for, uh, to the van, but I mean, the, the toilet was missing. But I found it last year. We have been driven uh, uh, in the past six years over 60,000 kilometers. But you can't see it on the, on, the, on the bus because we take very good care of it. For Martin Walter, other innovations included the dormatic seating design enabling seats to be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, I've got a 1967 uh, split-screen microbus and uh, it has a, a rather unusual doormatic uh, seat arrangement inside which is a English conversion uh, which I think there's probably about five or six possibly in the country. It was a conversion that was made by an English chap uh, called Martin Walter during the 60s. Uh, it, it's, it's original paint, so there are certain bits on it which I'd like to address, but uh, if I address that, then you're defeating the object of having an original paint vehicle. Uh, so I just let the elements do its worst, and if it gets out of hand, I'll, I'll start possibly restoring it then. But no, it, original is, is the theme here, and you know, I just rather keep it as it is. Although Dormobile conversions were well liked, by the 60s Devon had become the most popular UK VW camper option, offering conversions with exotic names such as the Caravette and Devonette. With conversions available on either the Combi or Microbus, a Devon was recognisable by its superb interior finish of light polished oak offset by curtains and usually a checkered floor. Yeah, this is a 1967 split-screen Devon camper. 
um, owned by my wife Caroline. And um, it's the last of the split screens. Um, this one was made um, in Germany, um, imported into Britain and converted into a camper by uh, Jack White, who uh, made all the Devon conversions down at Sidmouth, very close to where I live. It was uh, bought for somebody's retirement and then shortly after that bought by a wonderful old lady called Barbara Gabb, who uh, had it for uh, most of its life. This is one of the most original interiors in, in, in the country. It, it really hasn't been chopped about, it hasn't been messed about with, and it comes with all its original equipment. Well, it has a, a, a small cooker unit with a cupboard underneath it. The cooker unfolds and magically folds away again. Um, it has no sink, it has no water tank, it just has a water carrier and the original plastic bowl that came with it in 1967. Um, and that bowl was designed to go on a, a table on one of the open doors and it has a small um, aluminium uh, uh, shaving mirror that went above the bowl. So you'd, the idea was that they were hardy in those days, you'd stand outside and, and, and wash your hair or shave um, in the bowl looking at yourself in the mirror. It has two quite large storage cupboards, one of them under the back seat and another under the little side seat. Um, and then at the back it has a crockery and cutlery storage cupboard on the uh, right hand side. On the left hand side it has a small wardrobe for um, hanging up your clothing for your week away. This, this van is a walkthrough version which means that you can walk from the front driving area to the camping area at the back of the van. And that's a great advantage because it means that uh, you don't have to get out of the van, walk round to the back, um, pass the bulkhead and then get into the, the camping bit. It's extra special because it has a factory sunroof and there are very, very few, if any, other vans of this type which have a factory sunroof. So for a camper it's very unusual. It doesn't have a pop top but it does mean that you can slide the sunroof back and you can cook standing up in the open air, which is very exciting especially in a high wind. <laughs> As the market grew, other conversion companies joined the fray. Some were official, but many were not. Authorised converters were Danbury, Dormobile and Devon. Unofficial but well-known converters included Moortown Motors, service garages of Colchester, European cars and Caraversions. In 1963, Canterbury Pit updated and refined their single layout to produce the VW Canterbury Pit open plan motor caravan, which was similar to the Devon. This soon became a classic, and apart from the introduction of a walkthrough in 1965, the layout remained basically the same until production ceased in 1969. It's a 1967 split screen van and it's a Canterbury Pit interior. We were told about a van that was being an MOT failure and was being scrapped possibly and uh, we went and had a look at it and for £50 came away with a van. It was worth putting back on the road and a couple of hundred pounds down the line it was back on the road and used daily. <laughs> My husband worked on it, he built it from the bottom up and then we'd only owned it two years and I had a lorry run into me and take out the back corner, nearly wrote it off completely but we were determined to keep it back on the road and we put the money into it, kept it, continued to use it for family holidays, days out, VW shows, lots of events, my husband did most of the maintenance. Unfortunately, um, eight years ago, um, he was diagnosed with terminal illness. So when he passed away six years ago, I put some of the life insurance money into having the restoration done, finished, where he'd sort of started doing some welding, had it finished off. Um, and part of that was to have it restored the way he would have done it. 
By the mid-60s, the campervan was becoming a familiar sight on the roads of Britain and Europe, and further afield, as more daring travellers headed to Africa and the East at the start of the hippie era. It was at this moment that the campervan's association with the swinging 60s, peace movements, the beatniks and flower power began to take off. For many, the campervan offered a sense of freedom. I've got a 1967 uh, Volkswagen Type 2 split-screen camper, Westphalia uh, conversion. Yeah, the key features uh, with the 67 Westphalia model was the interior really. Um, they'd really sort of gone away from quite a basic camping interior to uh, a functional yet roomy interior which was easy to keep clean and just functional. Plenty of wardrobe space, cupboard space, um, a child's cot to go over the cab area. They had the pop top roof which allowed somebody to stand up and move around inside. You had the option um, with the SO42 to buy a, a, a camping, what they called the Big Top Tent, which fitted on the side of the double doors, um, which again allowed you greater living space, also with the option of a roof rack. Um, these were all options that you had to buy from the dealer. They didn't come as standard. From 66 to 67, they went over to a 12 volt electrical system. Um, there's a few other little, little changes here and there. Um, engines were a 1500cc instead of the 1200. Um, the indicators were fish lens. It was originally shipped from Germany in 19, early 1967, although it was made in October 66, shipped from Germany to the USA, January 67, sold to a guy from Memphis, Tennessee, and that's where it stayed for the majority of its life. Got shipped back into England around about 2005 by a restorer called Martin Hall, who gave it a total bare metal respray, total strip down, uh, restored it um, with the interior. He kept the original interior and just cleaned it up, put it all back together, and you can see for yourself, it looks like it's just stepped out of the showroom. The VW camper van's inherent individuality, the blank canvas it offered for those wanting to customize it, added to the appeal, as did its affordability. As opposition to the Vietnam War grew, it fitted neatly into the anti-war movement too. Much like the hippie scene, for surfers, the VW camper van represented the cheapest, friendliest way to hang out and wait until surf was up. Heinz Nordhoff died in April 1968, not long after the two millionth transporter rolled off the production lines. More significantly, he lived long enough to see the launch of the version of the transporter that has sold more than any other, the T2, or Bay Window. And in 1967, the second generation came out, which is the Bay Window transporter. Um, and of course, that was, a, again, at the time, a very modern car um, and very different drive to the, uh, the old split screen with its independent rear suspension, its better braking system, its bigger engine, um, better road handling all round. Um, and the bay window is probably one of the best known models. After Nordhoff's long reign as VW's champion drew to a close, a period of turmoil followed. Kurt Lotz, Nordhoff's successor, seemed determined to kill off his predecessor's golden goose and stated his intention to phase out the Type 2. But Lotz was soon replaced and in fact under its new guise the transporter went from strength to strength. The T2's most obvious alteration was the demise of the split window. 
in favor of a large, curved, one-piece windscreen, 27% greater in area than the old Splitty, hence its Bay nickname. The early models had other unique body features, such as curvaceous bumpers, front doors opening to 90 degrees from the body, no lip on the front guards, and prominent air intakes confirming the vehicle's improved heating, ventilation and demisting systems. Front indicators were now rectangular and set low on the nose, beneath the headlights, giving rise to another nickname of low lights. Front doors were made wider and the exposed door hinges were concealed for both aesthetic and safety reasons. The sliding door became standard, replacing the awkward double opening doors. Cab windows were finally given winders and the windscreen wipers were upgraded. The use of double-skinned metal sheets within the chassis and body construction gave the bay increased rigidity. It also enabled the designers to abandon the small square windows used in the T1 in favor of more modern, bigger, rectangular windows. The stronger chassis meant it was also slightly heavier and to compensate, the T2 favored a new 1.6-liter engine. Fuel consumption of 23 to 25 miles per gallon and a top speed of 65 miles per hour remained the same but a larger fuel tank extended the cruising range to 300 miles between refueling. The drive was improved significantly with better transmission, smoother steering and a new gearbox that did away with the reduction gears in the hubs. Also improved was the suspension thanks to the double jointed rear axle that delivered an almost car-like driving experience. The interior was also redesigned. It felt different and airy, with much better visibility. The T2 was destined for further improvements and modifications through the 70s. But this first new model was a remarkable improvement in ride and comfort. For many traditionalists though, the bay lacked the character of the splitty. VW continued to make improvements to the bay, in 1971, a new, more compact 1700cc engine was added, greatly improving performance. Also uprated were soundproofing and the rear lights, made larger for safety reasons. In September that year, the 3 millionth transporter was delivered. 1973 bays featured a new engine, but a mix of old and new styling and so were described as crossovers. Modern safety concerns drove the biggest changes to the T2 during its production. In 1973, the front was substantially modified to create a crumple zone that would buckle in an accident. The bumper step was moved inside the doors. The indicators were moved from below the headlights to either side of the ventilation grills creating the look that stayed with the T2 until production ended. In 1975, the last major upgrade of the T2 occurred when VW added their largest ever engine to the lineup. It was the two-liter air-cooled engine from their joint mid-engine sports car project called the VW Porsche 914. It offered T2 owners a top speed of 90 miles an hour. The VW Camper continued to outsell its competitors around the world several times over. No one could compete with a van that was just the right size and so easy to drive and park. In Canada and the US, Westphalia conversions were marketed as the Campermobile. They proved incredibly popular. Yeah, I've got a 1976, um, it's a uh, Type 2 VW, uh, it's um, an American spec, it's uh, a Campmobile Deluxe. The, the American spec vans that come in from California, they're um, really solid, but their paint is always really sun-bleached and faded. 
and so um, I just had a few dinks and dents sorted out and um, sort of a new coat of paint but same colour. I think the Californian vans were all one colour, they only came in a few colours. This one's tiger green. Um, the Campmobile Deluxe comes with a two-way fridge uh, and a stove and a sink. You could get four and four and a half people in because it's got double bed downstairs, double bed upstairs and you can get a child's bunk across the uh, cab. The LPG supplies the stove. Uh, most people who import the vans rip that off because they like to lower their vans but I've kept it at stock height and kept this so it's, it's quite rare these days. The last German-built T2 left Hanover in 1979, but it wasn't to be the end of the T2. The Mexican plant at Puebla opened in 1954, building T1s and then T2s, until production was transferred to the VW plant in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where the bay is still made. Well, I bought this thing that you can see here. She's called Molly and she's a 1991 Brazilian import. I bought her, oh, about a year ago now. But I just thought, this is the perfect thing. It's small enough to park anywhere, and yet you can sleep in it, camp, but you can do what you want in it. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, she chugs along at 60 miles an hour, 55, she's happy, and um, it's terrific. The bay window continued until 1979 when uh, the T3 came in, and T3 production, which is a, a complete redesign. It had a, a wedge shape, and it, a lot of people feel that uh, it lost a bit of character in doing so. The T3 was confusingly known as the T25 in the UK, and the T3, or Vanagon, in the US, or nicknamed the Wedge or Brick. It was something of a surprise when the T25 was finally revealed as the transporter's third incarnation. The wedge design had taken the transporter far from Pond's original sketch, and for some, it signalled the beginning of the end. The surprise was that the T25 shared as many characteristics with the T2 as it did in the increasingly competitive modern market. Particularly unexpected was the air-cooled rear engine. The increased dimensions had made the T25 heavier, and it was soon apparent that the existing 1.6-litre petrol engine wasn't really up to the job, so a larger 2-litre option was made available. The T25 was the first transporter designed with the help of computers. So some said this was the reason it lacked the transporter's human touch. But its aerodynamic wedge look, with a steeply raked front window, did not endear the T25 to transporter traditionalists. And they were further dismayed when, by the end of 1982, the last of the VW transporters to feature an air-cooled engine left the factory. It ended 33 years of continuous production, bringing to a close an era in which almost 5 million air-cooled Type 2s had taken to the world's roads. The engine became water-cooled instead of air-cooled, so it lost that distinctive sound and became a different beast altogether. So there is still a kind of division between water-cooled and air-cooled. In one aspect, nothing had changed. The T25 made for an excellent camper conversion, with Devon, Westphalia and Auto Sleeper all heavily involved in converting the new look transporter. Further change was afoot when, in 1985, VW entered the SUV or sports utility vehicle market with its four-wheel drive T25 called the Synchro. The Synchro was available across most of the T25 range, making it particularly attractive for use by the emergency services. The T3 continued through until 1990, then the T4 came along, uh, which is very popular, particularly as a commercial vehicle with the AA and fleets and things. In 1991, VW broke completely with the past, creating an entirely new breed of vehicle. The next generation T4, or Eurovan, 
shared few characteristics with its historical stablemates, with car-like dashboards, quality in-vehicle entertainment, and easily adjustable seating. It's the biggest turnaround, if you like, in the design of a vehicle. It kept its all-independent suspension, but you had an air-cooled engine, longitudinally mounted, driving the rear wheels, and we ended up with a product with a transverse engine um, at the front, driving the front wheels. But what remained was, um, if you like, a base vehicle that was again designed for carrying people and passengers, all-independent suspension, um, higher quality perhaps than competitors, more money put into the engineering side and durability and um, you know the, the Transporter, the T-Series if you like, has achieved the same success um, on the commercial vehicle side as Volkswagen has achieved with, with passenger cars. Although it failed to capture anything of the character and charisma of earlier Transporters, the T4 sold almost one and a half million vehicles, helping the Type 2 to pass the 8 million mark in 1997. And then in 2003, out came their brand new one, the T5, um, which is still going strong. It's probably one of the biggest selling vans worldwide today. The latest variant of the Type 2, and a new vehicle for the 21st century, arrived in 2003. Powered by a range of diesel-only engines, the T5 is clearly a vehicle that crosses over from passenger to commercial more than any other variant. T5 is fast, modern, reliable, beautiful to drive, really, really beautiful driver. Uh, it drives like a car, it doesn't drive like a van. Um, and it's very comfortable. What is perhaps surprising is that it took VW over 50 years of production before the company built its own camper van, the T5 California. Volkswagen has traditionally used Westphalia as um, a supplier for uh, camper versions of the transporter and, and this was acquired by a competitor. So a decision was made at the factory, well, if, if we can't um, use our traditional supplier, we will start our own division. So there is a division within the Volkswagen plant at Hanover that not only builds the California, which I think is the only camper van now designed and built by a manufacturer, but it also carries a lot of other bespoke, bespoke conversions on, on the transporter, business versions, versions with plasma screens and uh, um, offices and so forth. Volkswagen has created a luxurious vehicle with two sleeping areas, including one in the hydraulically raised roof, a two-burner gas cooker, a sink with a 30-litre freshwater tank, a 42-litre fridge, kitchen worktop, clothes cupboard and double glazing. The California was enthusiastically received, particularly in Germany. But it was also produced in a right-hand drive version for the British market, which surprised some pundits. So popular is the VW camper van scene nowadays that across the UK there are VW camper festivals and events almost every weekend between Easter and the end of October, including Camper Jam, Van Fest and Brighton Breeze. The VW camper is a fascination that covers all elements, from those determined that everything should be kept stock, VW speak for original, to those who customise their camper in an infinite number of ways. That's all leather, uh, cream leather with orange piping, that's all been, these are all new units, everything, it's been rebuilt from uh, a wreck. It was orange and cream, but this, uh, the respace, it's metallic orange this, it's not really ordinary orange, it's metallic, you know, I have nothing but the best. What am I like, me? I've always, always wanted one, and I thought, uh, I got to, a, well, 60, and I thought, well, it's getting time, isn't it? If I don't get it, if I don't get it, like, you know, before that, I haven't much time to enjoy it, so I went and bought one. Once they got you, that's it. 
It's like heroin. <laughs> but more expensive. <laughs> and the pride among the VW community is infectious. Oh, they're great fun. Absolutely fantastic fun. Everyone waves at you, the kids are obsessed with them. If you stop at a service station, you can guarantee there'll be a load of people taking pictures. And as with all great true stories, luck has played a part in the tale of the VW campervan. A genuine icon that grew from the ruins left by a world war to cross boundaries like no other vehicle ever built. Its beginnings were forged in a partnership by men who'd recently been on opposite sides of a terrible conflict. Perhaps the unique ability every campervan has to make people smile lies deep within the DNA of its origins. VW campervan owners know, wherever they are in the world, whatever van they drive, in whatever condition, of whatever age and origin, that they're part of something very special, something very unique, something that's unlikely to ever be repeated in the history of motor manufacturing. And that's quite a legacy.